vintage radio-related item with little-known facts or lore. The category for this topic is 1920s American-made broadcast receiver. This is my 2015 recreation of a glass-cased tuned radio frequency receiver design of 1926. Glass-cased radios were made for commercial radio exhibitions, as point-of-sale advertising sets in radio stores, even a very few brand-name radios came in glass cabinets. And amateur builders, ranging from the determined but unskilled maker to the stunning work of master machinists, were proud to exhibit their enthusiasm for this new radio technology for the American home, ranging from an elegant little two-tuber to a monster superheterodyne outfit said to contain 18 tubes. In all, there were never more than a few hundred sets made, and only a handful of vintage sets survive today. Many moons ago, like back in the 1980s, I found this derelict home-built outfit at some sort of vintage radio meet. It was built into a crude cabinet that was missing its lid. It had an ugly hard rubber panel that I really wondered if it could be made to look good enough for display. But it had a shickling S700 power output tube and three shickling SX4000 tubes in it. I wanted those tubes. And the price was right for a guy like me with little play money. It has RF transformers of a style I'd never seen before. Those unique Rimmler tuning capacitors. Red sleeve Cutler Hammer tube sockets. Brett Wood adjustable grid leak. Amperite filament ballast resistors. Beautiful Keras harmonic audio transformers, Allen Bradley, Bradley Ohm, carbon pile filament rheostat for the audio output tube, Allen Bradley, Bradley Leak, high value carbon pile rheostat for volume control, and those cool shekeling tubes. I thought that these parts would look great in a glass case. I experimented with drilling holes in quarter-inch thick plate glass using spade-type bits supposedly especially made for glass drilling, but my drilling efforts produced nothing but miserable failure. I simply gave up and placed this set under my workbench for the next few decades. Twenty-five plus years later, I find this article in Radio in the Home magazine dated June 1925. That's my radio layout. It's called a quadriformer receiver. Why had I never seen those coils? It turns out the coil maker was the Gearhart Schluter Radio Corporation in Los Angeles, California, far away from radio meets here on the East Coast that I could attend. With lots of documentation on the circuit, I had great incentive to make my glass set a reality. By 2014, you could buy diamond grit tubular drill bits for stone and glass at any big home improvement center like Lowe's or Home Depot. The best lubricant is supposed to be automotive antifreeze, although the instructions could not tell you that for liability reasons. I made this dam to contain the coolant. The plywood ring applies pressure on a foam rubber toilet tank gasket. The front glass panel has 12 holes. The safest way to drill is to drill halfway from each side. Otherwise, you will get breakout. Unless you are using a milling machine with positive Z-axis feed, that is. I finally had a drilling technique that I thought would work for me in my shop. So what could my glass set look like? I had nine years' experience using SolidWorks computer-automated design software at work, 
but never had a need to do photorealistic rendering of my work, I decided to give it a try. I created basic models of each part and arranged them just like my set layout in the magazine article. I pretty much let the rendering defaults of the software do their thing. Pretty cool, eh? On retiring, I really hated that I no longer would have access to a SolidWorks seat license. A full render from this perspective has me feeling pretty good about how it would look. I wondered how it might look if it was on top of a battery box like the Greeby ME1 dry cell set. It would give me a chance to add some cool marquetry of a microphone and lightning bolts. But no can do. The shickling tubes found with the set need a total of 1.5 amperes from a 6 volt battery and a B plus of 135 volts plus a little 22.5 volt C bias battery. Proper size batteries for this service would not fit in this base, which is already getting proportionally too large. I made the baseboard the old-fashioned commercial furniture way of the day. Create a sheet of poplar, lumber core plywood, and apply walnut veneer to the top side. Cut to size and add solid walnut trim with a common OG routed profile to bring the base to size. I decided to route a channel in the board that would be lined with green felt to serve as a nice cushion for the plate glass. By making brackets for the Remler tuning condensers, I saved having to drill 12 additional holes in the glass front panel. Making aluminum corner brackets for the glass panels was a fairly simple task. Decorative washers available back then were also created in aluminum. Red fiber washers were made to cushion the glass mounting holes. Well, phooey. I discover I'm missing a couple of solder lugs. I've gone this far, may as well make exact copy lugs. I used Electrolyst 10 solution on the brass after fabrication to match the old. Time to assemble and wire. A good old Dell laptop is always at the bench loaded with all my project pictures. This old laptop is just about worthless for anything else these days but the screen renders photos very well. But having cost me just $10 at a yard sale, there was no harm if it gets damaged on my chaotic bench. I want to do this right the first time. The controls were not labeled on the old panel, but that would not do for my recreation. This is the only glass-cased radio I will probably ever make and since the original circuit builder is unknown, I thought it would be okay to brand my recreation with tags like these. So here is the set in all its glory after an unreasonable amount of shop time. My one and only homage to the glass case sets of the mid-1920s. For me, photographing this set was a nightmare. Definitely such an object is best seen in person. Again, I've gone this far. I've got to use cloth-covered rubber wire for battery connections, bundled into cables in order to save on hole drilling. I did not think I could cut a slot or notch in the glass to access connections that way. You were not going to be motivated to build a radio back then unless you had devoured copious quantities of radio magazines, books, and hopefully had the good fortune to associate with other boys and young men infected with the radio bug. 
With a transparent radio cabinet to show the interesting components inside, I thought I should reveal all the other radio-related parts necessary to make this a useful device in the American home of the mid-1920s. So, I showed three large-size 45-volt B batteries and a 22.5-volt C battery. Since the radio looked new, I decided to show museum-grade replica batteries that I make. This set uses one quarter and one half amp filament tubes that were commonly powered from a six volt storage battery. I think I have the only complete surviving example of a full sized Willard lead acid battery branded as being specifically for Radio A battery service. They do not survive in collections because these full size batteries were taken to your local auto garage when pronounced dead to be sold for 50 cents to a dollar for the scrap value of the lead and maybe an extra bit of money for the hard rubber case. This was because of the booming automobile industry. Battery recycling and rebuilding was already a big business in the 1920s. If you did not want to take your A battery to the garage to be recharged every couple of weeks, you needed a hydrometer to measure charge state on your battery. That is in the red cardboard tube with screw cap. A trickle charger like this Balkite chemical rectifier could keep your battery topped off. You could have a Yaxley charge controller switch that would automatically disconnect the charger when you turned on the radio in order to prevent hum in your radio. You needed some sort of loudspeaker, and why not use something like this nifty Tower Adventurer cone speaker that could be easily driven by that shickling S700 power tube. But for DX work, you were going to need headphones. We know this set was being used for DX because of the notations on the removable paper logging scales found on these Remler dials. We are not done yet. For DX work, you are not going to use an inside loop or a piece of wire strung about the room for an antenna. No, sir. You needed a proper outdoor skyhook, aka long wire antenna. Boxed antenna kits were commonly available containing the antenna wire, porcelain or glass insulators, lead-in wire, a few insulator standoffs, a lightning arrestor, and a hefty ground wire, and copper clamp for a grounding rod driven into the soil, or if there was a cold water pipe close by, that would do also. Since I could not bring an eight foot long ground rod into the exhibition area, I could at least show the ground clamp on an old brass water spigot. 